Uh, before I talk about yesterday, I'd like to tell you a little story. Um, on Friday, I leave to go to Indonesia, where I'm going to attend a conference called the International Seaweed Symposium. I mean, it just doesn't get any more exciting than that. <laughs> 500 people that all we do from the moment we get up in the morning till we go to bed is talk about seaweed. All day, we dream about seaweed all night. It's just, for us, it's like Mecca. But what it is, it's 500 of the top researchers in the world, in this field. It's 500 of the top industrialists in the world. And it gives me a chance to go and see just how is our company doing, because this symposium is only every three years, how are we doing against the rest of the world, and how does our research stack up against what everybody else is doing? The other thing that we like to do is when we go to these symposiums is we like to come home with souvenirs. And 15 years ago, when I went to the Seaweed Symposium in Valdivia, Chile, we came home with Dr. Raul Ugarte. <laughs> now, we convinced him to come to Canada, live here, and he is now the most qualified scientist in the management of marine plant resources in the ocean, in the world. And he's looked on, and whenever there's uh, uh, papers that need to be published, he is the person that people go to to review those papers. Nine years ago, when I went to the Seaweed Symposium in Cape Town, South Africa, we came home with Dr. Alan Critchley, who was lived, working in France, and we convinced him and his family to come to Canada and work as our Vice President of Research. There was nobody more qualified in the world to, be, to do what we needed to have, and we recruited him and brought him to Canada. He convinced us to sponsor a chair at the Nova Scotia Agricultural College. And that chair was filled with Dr. Balakrishnan Prithiraj, or Dr. Raj, as we call him affectionately, who is now on his way to becoming a tenured professor. He's got nine researchers working for him at the uh, former Nova Scotia Agricultural College, now Dalhousie. And what we've been able to do is create, really, our own mini innovation ecosystem. Those people, along with the other uh, seven PhDs that we have on staff and the 25 researchers in total that we have, working with the scientific community here in Atlantic Canada at Dalhousie and National Research Council, Acadia and various other areas, put together this, this consortium of people and really create world-leading technology right here from Atlantic Canada. So now, on that note, what I'd like to talk to you about is the bigger picture eco innovation ecosystem and what we learned yesterday and how it applies here in Nova Scotia. First, I want to address the talk given by Stephen Hurwitz. In that talk, he indicated that there were three requirements for successful innovation, great ideas, research and development, and financing the commercialization. Now, I might add that actually doing the commercialization, I think, should be added along that line. He did a great job of explaining how Israel had set up a venture capital industry which did not exist prior to 1992. And then he compared it to the new investment that the federal government is going to make to leverage private industry, venture capital, patterned around what they did in Israel. Now, do I think that that's an important step in the path to generating economic value through innovation? Absolutely. You know, but however, I think there's something that's really important here. He talked about this from a Canadian approach. What we have to do is we have to ensure that there's venture capital management that is based right here in Atlantic Canada to evaluate Atlantic Canadian opportunities. Because if that's not here, it's going to be just that much more difficult for companies to obtain initial and subsequent rounds of financing. You know, I think Stephen made an extremely important point when he said, how does a country and how does a region fund its first generation entrepreneurs? Think about that. There's no point in developing an entrepreneurial spirit and culture as it exists at MIT and Waterloo if there's no way to fund these entrepreneurs. Avram Lazar did a wonderful job of explaining how existing sectors under severe challenges, here we're talking about the forestry sector in particular, 
can innovate to survive, perhaps not to the extent of historical success, but to the extent of being able to maintain a significant presence in today's economy. Now, I think this is particularly important, specifically in rural parts of Nova Scotia. The recipe of using innovation to radically improve productivity, expansion into markets outside the United States, the use of byproducts to create some kind of value-added product, along with the historical uses of lumber and pulp, and doing all of this in an environmentally sustainable way, those things are key to transforming that industry and to be allowing it to be successful in the future. Now, it may not be a perfect fix, but allows this industry to survive. As we take a look at this sector, he had four pieces of advice that I think we can use today. One, projections can be changed. What he talked about is if you're going to go, go with the status quo and you look at uh, continuing that, uh, um, if it's a path that's not going to be successful, you, could, you can change that. You can find a way to, 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 to move it. Two, you're not alone. The government and the academic institutions are there to help. And three, take care of what you have now and innovate your way out of the unsustainable position that you're in. And lastly, take time to evaluate that shiny new opportunity to ensure that it is right for you for proper long-term economic gain. I mean, there's no point in doing something different if it's really not going to get you out of there. Now, let's move to Brazil, where His, His Excellency gave us an overview of the history of research and innovation in Brazil and where we are today. Brazil's economic challenges in the past were absolutely monumental. Hyperinflation, a policy of industrialization by import substitution. Well, that's just, that's just a fancy way of saying we're not going to let imports in and allow our domestic manufacturers a chance to make inefficient products. Really a recipe in the long run that lowers the standard of living. Yet now, Brazil has stabilized its economy and is investing heavily in R&D through many initiatives. In particular, I was impressed with the $1.6 billion investment in 100,000 scholarships for Brazilian students to study around the world. Our company, Acadian Sea Plants, has benefited from these students in that a number of years ago, we hired two Brazilian graduates from the local MBA programs right here in Halifax and assigned them the task of developing markets for our products in Brazil. Today, we have three full-time employees in Brazil, including one PhD who work full-time to develop the export of our value-added products from Nova Scotia to Brazil. We expect by the end of this year that we'll have six employees in Brazil and see Brazil as having virtually unlimited growth potential for us. Brazil is in the process of developing leading edge technology for deep water exploration and production. Technology that we need and can use to develop our own offshore resources. Our challenge is to find ways to either partner or lever this type of technology with Brazil to create an environment that encourages R&D and innovation in this sector right here in Nova Scotia. Tom Jenkins gave an excellent overview of what has been created in the Waterloo area in literally recent history. Now, I think there's one point that he mentioned yesterday that I believe is worth repeating and stressing here today. He said that the quality of the research that we have here in Nova Scotia is on par with what is in Waterloo today. Now, that's not a trivial point. We have world-leading research and world-leading researchers at our local universities and at local government research institutions. Specifically, those that I'm familiar with are at Dalhousie University and National Research Council. We would not be the world leaders in what we do at our company, Acadian Sea Plants, if it wasn't for the partnerships that we have created with both of these institutions. I was also intrigued by his statement that innovation is an economic process and not a technical process. Think about this as today we think about what we need to do in Nova Scotia to encourage innovation and commercialization. Tom took the time to explain how he sees the three pillars necessary for innovation and commercialization in Canada, with the three pillars being industry, government, university, and research institutions. Let's take a look at industry. He believes, and I shared a thought, that industry must be thinking globally and be able to compete on a global basis. He believes that government should be a customer and should use its massive procurement capabilities to foster innovation and commercialization right here in our country. Now, 
I believe there's a massive opportunity through the $25 billion shipbuilding contract that was going to take place here. And lastly, he believes that universities and research institutions have an extremely significant role to play in innovation up to the point of commercialization, when it's really industry's role to take the lead and to make sure that economic value is created. I also believe that even in the commercialization phases, there is a role in certain industries for university and research institutions for ongoing support as required. Now, Tom indicated that government has a significant role to play in providing a proper operating environment for encouraging business-led innovation and research and development. He believes that the government should move away from a tax credit for research and development efforts towards more targeted direct funding of business-led research and development. Well, I don't agree with this. Let's look at one simple aspect of that. If industry sees an opportunity, it can make a decision tomorrow morning to invest in that opportunity and apply for that tax credit later on after the fact. Under a targeted program, most of the time, the work cannot start until the project is approved. In today's increased competitive environment and globalization, can we really afford to introduce a new delay in business-led research and development. And finally, I finish with my comments on Eric Grimson's presentation on how MIT has embraced not just a culture of innovation, but a culture of entrepreneurship throughout the years. I might add that there are two Nova Scotia companies at the MIT Accelerator. They are Mindful Scientific and Equal Six. So we're already creating world-class startups right here in Nova Scotia. We just need to do more of it. So right after Eric's presentation, I couldn't wait to ask him one question. Of course, it helped that he was sitting at my table. I wanted to ask him, what does my son have to do to get accepted at MIT in the undergraduate program? <laughs> I mean, I couldn't wait to go home and tell my son who's in grade 10 and has an aptitude for engineering about this incredible presentation that I saw yesterday. But after I calmed down, I did ask him one other question. How do you take a university that has been built on the traditional model of academic research for the sake of knowledge and turn it into a university that fosters such an incredible focus on not only innovation, but on entrepreneurship and economic value creation? First, and this may seem simplistic, you have to decide that you want to do it. Tom, and now you, Richard, you must decide, do you want to have an institution that looks more like MIT, or do you want a more traditional university? This is not as easy as it sounds, because you simply cannot take a tenured professor who came into a university and succeeded because he or she was very good at creating knowledge for knowledge's sake, and now tell them, well, I expect you to start a new company. That is like telling me I should be publishing papers. It just doesn't work. But over time, the leadership at universities can change the reward system to ensure that those that work with industry and cause industry to be successful do get promoted and do get rewarded. I think the thing that impressed me the most is how MIT has tweaked and tweaked their program, their relationships, their reward systems, and virtually everything else that could be tweaked to not only encourage their students, but also encourage their faculty and encourage the tremendous business community that they have helped. A business community that just hangs around the MIT area because it makes good business sense for them to be there. You know, Many times I've been asked, what do we have to do to create an enhanced culture of entrepreneurship in this province? Yesterday we were presented with as good a blueprint as you could ever imagine to enhance innovation and entrepreneurship in this province. All we have to do is follow it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And on that note, I'll turn it back to Martha. <laughs>